Human design is a part science, part spiritual system that tells you who you came here to be. You have your own blueprint, your own way of becoming successful, your own way your dreams are going to come true, the way you'll experience the most joy and fulfillment. The instruction manual for how to move through the world is custom to you. When you act according to that manual, when you act as the real you, everything in life comes to you with more ease and less resistance. We all know we're different, yet we're still acting like there's one way to do life. Let's talk about it. To find out your design and the designs of the people in your life, you can visit myhumandesign.com or download the My Human Design app in the App Store and on Google Play. If you've been with us for a while, you probably have heard me say before that our attention and our intention and our energy are our biggest currency and they're also the most valuable thing about us because they are the raw materials that get turned into anything else that we create in this world. And I really feel that we are in a really interesting time where on the one hand we have so many options of what to absorb and put our attention into, what grabs our attention more than any other time in history. And yet the paradox is also that we value information so much less because we have so much of it and it's harder to curate. The challenge now is if anything can take our attention, what do we give it to? And this got me thinking about the topic of ADD because what is ADD? And I feel like everyone is getting diagnosed with ADD. But if you think about the words attention deficit, i.e. we are being, we are low on our battery of how much attention we are retaining, then probably all of us have an, an, an attention deficit disorder because we are leaking our attention on so many things that that currency is constantly depleted. And of course, there are times and places for diagnoses like this, but I also do feel that in the same way that even if you're not an anxious person, having six coffees will make you feel like you have anxiety. It's kind of the same way in if you leak your attention, you will feel and you will have the experience of someone who is in attention deficit. And the reason why I think this is so important is because now more than ever, it's so key to preserve your attention, even if it's do nothing with it, to sit on those reserves rather than use it on something that if you look at what really matters in your life, is it going to give you anything? And it doesn't necessarily mean that the only things that take your attention are, you know, overtly philanthropic causes or spiritual causes. But if you're doing something for the purpose of having fun, please make sure you are actually getting a sense of fun from it. If you're doing it for an escape, please make sure that you are getting an escape from it and you're not getting tossed by these currents of overstimulation to the point where, you know, we all know that feeling of when we're in such a trance that we don't even know where the time has gone. So our attention has been used unintentionally. So those two things work together and they have to work together so much now. And I say this for the people who I think there are some people out there who feel like they have ADD and that it's a, it's a defining or consistent diagnosis when actually a lot of it could just be acute rather than chronic where if you make some adjustments and you call your attention back to yourself, you might find that you feel like a different human because it's your habits that make up the way that you see your personality, um, which is the whole point of conditioning. Someone was asking me the other day, like, is conditioning just our subconscious beliefs? And I said, no, it's, um, it's what society is telling you every day. It's what you're absorbing. It's what you're hearing. It's what you are telling yourself and talking yourself into doing because you think that makes you belong, right? So it's not just stories from our past. There's conditioning all around us. Even other human beings can be conditioning forces because they're different than us. And so they bring us into this temptation of, do I need to be anything other than what I am already? So 
I want us to also realize how fungible our idea of our personality is and how different the the big the spectrum is of how different you can feel being you when you understand that it's on you and you have the power more than enough power to steer the ship of how you feel as a person in your in your body in your experience in your lived experience day to day and so you know those days when your life is so enriching that you forget to look at your phone you do feel like a different person right those days when you are doing something that is so fulfilling and you're giving in a different way, you feel like a different person. You know, something as a silly example, and people use this all the time, I feel like a different person when I make sure that I go to bed at a reasonable hour, you know, and that changes the way that I ascribe traits to my personality. If I go to bed at two in the morning for five nights in a row, my brain is going to quickly go into these stories of you're always tired, you can't do it, you don't have energy, and so on and so forth. And we we literally go blind to the most obvious links that we're making. And our world is draining us of our attention right now. The consumerism is draining us of the attention right now. The division in our society is draining us right now of our attention. The favorite tool that the inner opponent or the ego likes to use, which is the straight up divide in politics that you'll fall on one side or the other, you know, there's nothing that gets people more into that division than, than heightened politics, nothing. And so to be able to watch that these temptations are, you know, it's, it's fairly obvious. If you do X, you're going to feel like Y. And it's almost time that we start making things and seeing them as that radically obvious and that radically simple, the way that we see if we give our kids sugar, he or she is going to be jumping off the walls at 8 p.m. With ourselves, we are that simple, even though our minds have gotten more complex. And since we were eight years old, the very habits do create our personality. And that's the whole thing is about if you could decondition and you could give your real self a chance to come out, it really is about more clearing the gunk that's in the way. And the gunk is obviously the beliefs, the thoughts, but think about the fact that thoughts and beliefs create habits, but it's a two-way system in the sense that your habits also have an effect on your thoughts. And so as much as we know that the phone is addictive and as much as we know that looking at what everyone else is doing is probably not always healthy. And as much as we know that, you know, doom scrolling and binging on things or whatever isn't good for us, we haven't quite made the connection to the suffering that we're having, to the things that we think are constraints on us or the things that we believe are just issues about us that have come out of nowhere. And sometimes they are, but a lot of the time they are so habitual and can be so fixed in the same way that we know that diabetes can be massively helped with food, mental health can be massively, massively changed and up leveled when you realize that you are the guardian of this precious kingdom inside of you, which is your mentality, your attitude, your consciousness, your thoughts, whatever you want to call that thing. And that if you start treating it as sacred, not only will it become much more obvious to you as to what you choose to let in, but all of a sudden you will realize that, of course, I'm struggling with depression or anxiety or attention deficit because not because I'm doing anything wrong, but because I'm not intending anything on purpose. And so I'm just getting swept away with the default current that we're all swimming in right now. And the reason I think it's so important to share this is because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding that it's either just you or that you caused it or there's something functionally wrong with you but we also know that the body no matter even if it comes from a starting place you know kids that are born not well does know inherently it's built into their dna that it is a self-healing mechanism we don't have to know how to heal it we just have to get everything out of the way you know nature's operating table is alive and well And we hear so many stories about this, but we have to, in order to be able to even allow that to happen for us, we have to let these monikers and these diagnoses feel a bit more fungible and temporary than concrete. And also put aside, you know, like you mentioned sugar as something that could cause that experience of attention deficit or we're surrounded by phones, we're surrounded, we're inundated by information. You take all that aside and 
attention our as in our ability to put our energy and attention onto something is sort of it's like a mechanism that dictates and helps you as a person understand what you are supposed to put your energy towards. So there's some there's some areas of interest that I, no matter how hard I try, I cannot apply my attention towards understanding or getting involved in that thing. And so there's nothing wrong with that. I actually was having a conversation with my brother. You know, his life theme is to do with literally making um, spaces more better for all of us. He was literally saying to me this weekend that, he, so he was diagnosed with ADD as a kid and um, he told me he's not taking his medication anymore. He's like, I don't need it anymore. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, I just, he's in his lane. He's building commercial developments. He is so honed in and pumped and focused on the thing that he's doing. He's like, I just, I don't even have that experience of needing it anymore. Isn't that crazy? And I'm not saying that that's a, you know, Mm -hmm. fix all for everybody. I'm just saying it's interesting that when he began applying his attention to the thing that was his purpose, suddenly he was more capable or felt more capable of applying his attention. Yes. And and it's always there. The body is just a canvas that is here to deliver the message to us that something is out of whack. And sometimes the out of whack thing, I don't always want to say it's it's because you are always out of alignment. Sometimes out of whack could be a genetic thing. You know, sometimes out of whack could be a dietary thing. Sometimes out of whack could be in your life. You know, a lot of people's, a lot of our problems get solved when we finally feel like we have a purpose and something that is, um, you know, fulfilling to do with our time. And it's interesting because, you know, like you're saying that not everyone's, if you're trying to force your attention to be good at something, which you just cannot, you know, that look to your human design to see what you're supposed to be applying it towards. And someone was asking me this question the other day of, oh, it's so matrixy that we still have a government, right? And I actually thought to myself, it's it's funny because it's not so much about the structure of government because it's more about the consciousness in all these institutions that needs to change, right? We talk about this in one of probably the most important new paradigm workshops we have in the app is called The Quiet Revolution, which explains all of this about how things will actually change um, in terms of all these things. But, you know, there are certain people who are very, very gifted at lawmaking and understanding justice systems and weighing up um, moral uh, agreements in a very cool way uh, collected removed way or some people who are very good at it in a impassioned way and you know i think about people in politics the highest expression of people in politics are humans who are good at doing that on other people's behalf humans who are good at advocating for a person who is not in a position for whatever reason of being to able to advocate themselves or not in a privileged enough position to be able to have someone to speak on their behalf and consider them right maybe that isn't happening now, but that that's that's the solution is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and to say, well, if we have no government, then what everyone has to understand every single system and make a decision about every single thing around them. No one wants to do that. You just want someone who you really respect and really trust to do that role. Just like I need someone I really respect and really trust to go to as a doctor. I need someone who I really respect and really trust to manage the back end of the app like you. You know, I can't, the amount of energy that it would take me to have to do all of those roles is silly and not what any of us are meant to do because we complete each other in that way, right? So we need the perfect allocation of human resources of people who do that. And so as we're talking about politics, I think that's also another really interesting thing is you don't you don't need to be telling yourself that, you know, down with everything because these structures, especially as we move into the new paradigm, we want to look at the good things that we've built, the good side of those things and keep the good sides and just throw out the bad. We don't want to be saying, I hear a lot of people in the spiritual community say, oh, the dollar's over, you know? And I'm like, trust me, you don't want the dollar to be over. <laughs> now we're getting, listen, we need me to have an open ajna, so let's not go there. But, you know, there's so many things about, there's so many things about really understanding that what fascinates you 
is supposed to be where you go. Go towards the heat and go away from what you think you need your attention to be on, to be cool, to belong, to numb, to escape, or because without any intention, just because everything in our life that we're, we are always manifesting, you've probably heard that before. If you're not manifesting intentionally, you are manifesting unintentionally, meaning that the status quo that surrounds you, the soup of energy that you're in, is what you're just going along with. And that is what life is ta- saying is your intention. So if you are demonstrating as someone who comes home and binges on TikTok every night with a screen on in the background, no judgment against that. But if you're doing it from a from a un- from a thoughtless, unintentional way, the more times you go unintentional or unconscious in your life, that's less time that life can come and interact with you, right? So when you set strong intentions or you own the choice that you're making at least, right? Then life is like, okay, I got you. Like if I wanna come home and watch YouTube, which I do very often, you know, if I need to switch off and I'll just watch like, honestly, I watch like the Today Show and the equivalent of that show in the UK. And I watch just silly things of people talking about cute stuff and that's my switch off, right? But I... I'm doing that on purpose and I'm doing that without any judgment. And I'm doing that because I know it gives me what it gives me. So it's a clean interaction. It's so different than when I am doing things without really knowing what I'm getting back from those things. You know, it's so different when I'm doing things that everyone else is doing. It's so different when I am filling my time with something because I feel like I need to use my attention on something. And that is what this all really comes down to. When I say preserve your attention, you don't need to be spending it on something at every moment of the day. And that's when they say you pay attention. What are you doing? You are spending a currency. So at the same time that I am completely okay with the times that I switch off, I also really try, and now more than ever, especially during these times, I really try to keep some in reserve so that attention can be made available for the universe to come to me and give me intuitive messages, give me direction, give me channeling, give me advice on what the next thing to do is, give my intuition time to kind of speak to me and come through me. And it's incredible what starts to happen. I mean, There's memories I've had that have popped back into my mind in the last two weeks that have genuinely come, not because I've sought them out, but literally just because I've been, I've had free energy available to to be taken by those things. And every single time that memory has something to teach me or to remind me of, oh, this pattern was around much longer than I thought, or maybe it, I started doing this at a, at a different time than I was telling myself, or, oh, that's where that came from, or, oh my gosh, what can I learn from that lesson? I never really clocked it at the time because I was in such a funny place in my life, or whatever it is. And it's like life is really trying to get us on the fast track. And by preserving our attention, we give it the chance to put us on the fast track. And so, yes, absolutely. Use some of your, most of your attention, hopefully, on things that really matter to you purpose, family, loved ones, togetherness, loving yourself, making yourself feel good, doing things that bring you joy and a little bit on the side for some extra fluff to feel like the fun of being human and how cute all of that stuff is too. But leave a little 10% in your bank, leave a 15% there and you will find that maybe you don't have attention deficit. And you know, it's crazy that I even say this and I'm including myself here, but to say to preserve 10% of your attention, It's so difficult because imagine we're not just even doing one thing at a time. And that's also where it's coming from is like, we're living in a two screen reality where we often have a phone and a laptop going, a phone and a computer going, a tablet and a TV at the same time. And so even narrowing it down to not only having free time, but singularly focused time is hard enough in today's world for all of us. And so this is really a, a, just a, a handhold that we can all participate in to say that if there is a part of us deep down that feels like our attention and our energy is so powerful and it can lead us to places 
where it can be used. It is, like I said, it's the raw fuel that can create anything. It's what creates planes. It's what creates rocket ships. It's what creates satellites. It's what creates the best art, the best songs. It's the thing that makes everything else that is good in this world. If there is a part of us that believes that, can we just save some and give it back, repay it to the universe and to our connection with the universe rather than our connection to earthly things? And in many ways, that is what one could call calling your power back, but it's also not putting anything above God, you know? And you know, there's that saying of anything you put above God, you will lose. It's that saying of worshiping false idols, i.e. believing that the source of your light is going to come from anything else other than that connection that you have to the universe. So of course, we can know this, but the practice of it comes from being okay with having energy and attention and intention free in reserve because we know, or we at least want to know and find out what the universe might be able to use that for and do that with. And it is a leap of faith that we take when we show that action to the universe, that it can then demonstrate to us that it does in fact work and it is real and it is a force that is alive and well in our lives. It's so funny that you're bringing this up because I literally yesterday I was in the park walking my dog thinking I want to talk to you about, ask you this question because I am that person that my vice is, you know, when I'm wanting to numb or when I'm like hard things are happening, I I do in the past I have gone to social media and done a lot of overconsumption with that and I I think I've mentioned in some of the, some episodes that I've removed that and then I found myself wanting to move to some other vice like all of a sudden I'm like craving ice cream again and I really haven't had white sugar or refined sugar in a while and um, I'm in that right now. And I was in the park and I was thinking, gosh, like, is it impossible for us to not have a vice? I know this is kind of taking the conversation in another direction, but it is a bit of that deficit conversation where it's you're asking us to sort of allow, call back our attention, allow some of our attention to stay reserve inside of us so that more can come to us. But it's really, and you know this, I know you know this, like, It's uncomfortable to not be, you know, relying on some vice to fill up, not even just that attention, even just that energy, Um, Mm -hmm. having something that is blocking us from having something to put our attention on. Because I think uh, um, when, especially when things are hard, it's, um, we're afraid that our attention is going to go in the direction of the hard things that we're experiencing in life yeah and we don't want to experience those so that's why we're sucking up our time with two screens been Mm -hmm. there um so i guess my question is acknowledging the discomfort in that but also like do you think it's possible for us to actually exist in a world where we like don't have any vices like that it's such a good question because i think even the word vices has this like negative connotation as if going to the vices is bad. Now, it depends on what, to what extent you're going to the vice, right? If you are someone who, if you were someone who has never been taught or tried to face a feeling before, that's a much bigger problem than how I think a lot of our listeners, our cluster would be using them as, which is kind of like a training wheel, i.e., you know, when you're in a really, really rough time, when you're facing something really uncomfortable, you kind of go through phase one, which is, you know, staying in bed a little bit longer or going for the ice cream or going for the morning shows or whatever it is, like whatever your thing is, because anything can be that. Um, But as long as you know that that's almost phase one of when something is so charged, you, it's not necessarily the time when you're so raw to deal with it because you almost have to let the dust settle a little bit. And so in the meantime, you're maybe just soothing. And I think when I'm in those moments, 
because I know I'm going to get to it later. So I, it's not, it's not imbalanced. I say, oh, that's so sweet. Like humans are so cute. Like, look at us. Like we have all these feelings and they're so big and they're bigger than our bodies know how to hold. And so isn't it adorable that you're just having a bit of chocolate or a bit of ice cream or that you're staying out too late or you're staying up too late. Or, you know, that's my biggest, that I would say that's my biggest, um, one of my biggest vices staying up, staying up late. But you know, from a, from a, from a negative place. Cause there's obviously also positive, uh, expressions of that too. Like there is of anything, but it depends on how you use the vices. And I also think that everyone probably has one that they default to. And it's interesting. Like you said, it's, it's kind of like a whack-a-mole when if you get rid of one, another one will most likely come up. Do I think it's possible that some people completely live without vices? Absolutely. But do I think maybe there's a part of it that's healthy where when you're aware of what you're doing, right? Cause your attention is coming from here rather than being spun by the outside all the time, because you have some left inside your reserve to redirect your intentions and have self-awareness. You can say like you are, I know that I'm going to ice cream because I'm in having a difficult time right now, but it doesn't worry me with you, for example. And I don't think it worries you either. Cause you know, at some point you're going to be like, you know what, the charge is kind of gone. And now I actually can be in a moment where I can sit with it and I can face it. And I know exactly how to do that. And I'm well seasoned in it where it gets problematic is when you pick up a vice and 20 years later, it's still on an automatic pilot. And again, you're not doing it out of intention. You're doing it from a genuine loop that you're just unconsciously replaying. And it has a hold over you that you don't even know where the hold even came from because it's become sort of part of the furniture, right? It's become part of who you think you are because it's defined your persona and that therefore you've come up about narratives about what it makes you as a human being. If all of a sudden you think you're a sugar addict, whereas there's no part of you right now that thinks you're a sugar addict because you're like, oh, I've been unaddicted to sugar so recently and it's just come in just now and I'm sure it'll be over soon. And I think that does happen a lot when we are in the first stage of it's too hot right now that I can, for me to see it clearly, even my wise inner parent knows to let the child kind of have its dummy before it can come in and say, you know what, that's enough of that now. And let's actually get you to bed and let's actually give you a bath and it's time to wash up. And, you know, we don't, we don't rush to do that with kids. So why would we, we let them have the tantrum, you know, we let them cry it out. So it's the same thing with us, I think. Yeah. And I think the reason why I haven't been, you know, beating myself up about it is because we have had conversations where, um, I, I can't remember the exact way that you've put it, but that sometimes something, even though it can seem like it would be poison or not, not, not that sugar, like I'm not saying sugar is poison, but like it could be a poison for me to become an addiction. Like that's actually take coming off of the social media numbing. That's actually the next step in the right direction for me. And it's okay that I don't have to completely remove all numbing agents from me. I can kind of, you know, be conscious of myself and say, actually, this is a step in the right direction. So I think the reason I wanted to bring that up is because mm. if you are listening to this and you're you're thinking, well, gosh, I do spend so much time like wasting my attention away on content and I watch every YouTube vlog, which I love YouTube vlogs. Like mm. You're watching all these things and you're like, I actually don't you'll go into it and realize it's actually much harder to call back your attention than you thought. And mm. then it kind of pisses you off because you're like, <laughs> whoa, these like little pieces of videos that I'm scrolling, why did these things have so much control over like what I'm doing with my time that kind of like, pisses you off. So whatever like a, the next easiest step out of that is to call back your attention, like it might be different for everybody. Mm -hmm. For me, it, it has been that. So yeah, just putting that out there. It's really, really about giving yourself grace. It's really about being able to describe exactly the process you're in versus not knowing why you do the things you do and you just do them just because. And that's such a different energy than when you know what you're doing, you know when to use it as medicine and in what dosage versus when it just captures you because you're the one being bought. You're the one, 
you know, it's the technology that's in control. It's the substance that's in control. It's, and you are simply a victim swimming in the sea of, of that thing. And that's really energetic sovereignty. That's really consciousness sovereignty. That is rulership over self comes from that. When you realize that everything outside of you is simply a tool that also takes on the energy of the consciousness you interact with it on, right? So I know, for example, that I watch those British morning shows when I want to feel like I am, you know, it's that comfort, it's that home comfort because I don't live in England anymore, right? Versus when I just put it on because I put it on yesterday. It's completely different energy, same thing. Same exact thing that I'm watching, two different things. So being aware of why you do something in the first place, choosing another reason that that is a good enough reason because it's giving you something and knowing what it's giving you, those are three very important things to become re-intentionalized with your life. And at the same time, really trying to flex that muscle, which we all need to do right now, of leaving some energy and some attention left in the bank because you will find therefore that you are a lot more powerful than someone who lacks attention or someone whose brain doesn't work properly or someone who can't focus. You absolutely can focus. Of course you can focus. Maybe your focus looks a slightly different way than other people's. Like if you're a manifesting generator, you are supposed to focus on lots of different things in certain times or you are supposed to move a lot faster than other people. Your energy is supposed to be, you have a lot more of a reserve and so you have to know how to handle that differently than if you were a reflector, for example. So, And this is where human design really comes in handy. Why is it called your energy type because it's a it's a manual on how to master your specific battery your specific engine and how you work with that so that you can actually make the most of it and become a genius and give yourself a chance of becoming someone who is creative and smart and at the top of their game and in so much service to the world and so excited and fulfilled in yourself and living a life that you couldn't even imagine that amount of satisfaction in your life could exist right but in order to do that you have to work with your energy. And that's why energy type is so important in human design because it's saying, this is how yours peaks and troughs and how it works and how much of it to use and how much sleep is affected by it and what juices it up and what brings it down. And if you honor all those things, you will find that you have exactly everything you need to be able to accomplish the exact karmic path that your soul chose before you came here. Yeah, I... And I think the this the diagnosis that a lot of people are getting with the attention deficit, it's for some people, it's, you know, liberating. It's the first time that they've been told, wow, okay, my brain works differently and it gives mm-hmm. them the tools to actually empower them to behave in a different way that works better for them. And then I think some people, me being one of those people, because I was diagnosed with it as a child, it wasn't empowering to me. It, it made me feel like something was wrong with me. And for me, I think it's always looking for, like you've always said, if, if a tool is not making you feel empowered, then maybe it's not a tool that's going to work for you. And so also giving people permission of like, if this, if that diagnosis doesn't make you feel powerful and capable, maybe look somewhere else for a description. Human design has been that for me because I've understood, oh, I don't actually have a deficit. I don't have something wrong with me. I just function in this very unique way. And when I function in this very unique way, wow, do I feel more empowered and powerful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of why human design has come to us only at this time in history, because it doesn't maybe necessarily give you the the diagnosis, right? Which is just, let's just say, the let's just call it a diagnosis as a temporary read on how your outputs are showing up right now. What human design does is say, let's let's actually align the inputs to get the best out of you, however that looks. And then we don't need to judge what that looks like because when you feel like you're on fire and you're living an aligned life, you have no issue if your mind goes to 25 different places or if you have no issue if you can only focus for three hours a day. It doesn't, it doesn't bear any weight on you because you are already aligning your life as a result and you are not using your mind to do things that are reaffirming your sense of lack in the world. And this is really my my biggest wish because I know how much of our problems 
mostly our mind struggles, right? Not actual necessarily always physical problems, but things that we find to be problematic with our own judgment dissipate, dissipate and disappear when we do something that we feel is so not only life-giving to ourselves, but we see is also providing a beautiful service to other people. And that is really one of the most important things for us to do during this time, because the more of us realize that we are creators with the creativity beyond what a, a brain can fathom, it's that force, that utter presence of that's when the universe will be, or, the, or God or the whatever you want to call it, will be so everywhere around us. We will sense it in everything we touch and do because it's just driving our lives and it's at the forefront of everything we're doing. Its presence will be undeniable. And that's when life is gonna get really, really juicy for all of us is when that's the thing that's running the show, the primary force on this planet. But we need all of us to be constantly reaffirming it to each other and being part of that, right? Of leading with the life force ourselves, more people doing it and in doing so, that's conditioning, but it's conditioning of the most incredible kind. <laughs>